free. Mr. Bejeron's on. Don't forget the popcorn, Frank. Coming, dear. However, however, Massachusetts will still tax you. We will still tax you, right, for the pleasure of having come to Massachusetts and lived these happy months here in the campground. And the way that we're going to do that is we're going to, we're going to first of all, look at your total estate. So if the, in this case, if your total estate is $1.2 million, we're going to say, what is the tax you would have paid in Massachusetts if all your assets had been here? Then we're going to look at your Massachusetts property, which means this, right? Which means your campground property, which in this case we've assumed was $300,000, right? Uh, or 20% of the total estate of $1.5 million. How did I do that? I think this might have been a second Arthur Bergeron mistake. I'm assuming here that the estate was worth $1.5 million, Frank and Mary's estate. If it was, right, then 20% of that would be uh, three or three three hundred thousand dollars would be twenty percent of that or twenty and and twenty percent of the the Massachusetts inheritance tax of sixty four thousand four hundred dollars would be twelve thousand eight hundred eighty dollars so if you die owning this if Frank and Mary die owning this cottage here in Massachusetts and they live in any of these other states they will owe a Massachusetts inheritance tax what do they do about that um, well one possibility, um, and I think it's the only possibility uh, in Massachusetts, is to actually create a limited liability company. Uh, have um, the, and as long as all of the owners of the interest in the limited liability company are out of state, if Frank and Mary lived out of state and their children did and they were the owners of the limited liability company, and the limited liability company rules said that upon the death of Frank and Mary, uh, these interests in the property pass to the kids. Um, we believe that the Massachusetts Department of Revenue will take the position um, that those limited liability company interests are not taxable in Massachusetts. They are intangible personal property, taxable out of state. Um, this device is not available, uh, I am told by our tax experts, uh, by simply using a trust mechanism and having a trust owned by somebody that's out of state and beneficiaries that are out of state. Massachusetts takes the position in that case that there's still a Massachusetts inheritance tax that is owed, right? So the question you want to ask yourself is, what is it worth to you to avoid $12,880 in taxation, right? The vehicle to do this is to create a limited liability company, um, either in Massachusetts or out of state, having nothing but out of state owners. The problem with that is it's going to cost you a couple thousand dollars to create a limited liability company. And then every year there is a Massachusetts required fee for, for state or foreign limited liability companies of $500. So it, will, it may cost you, depending on how many years you have this limited liability company, um, as much as your $12,000. So it may be that it is not worth it to you to try to save on your estate taxation um, by doing any of these things, right? On the other hand, if your $300,000 cottage is, is, is part of a much bigger estate, it may be that at some point it is because the amount of tax that you would end up having to pay in Massachusetts is much higher than this. This is one of those places where you want to talk to your local attorney. You want to figure out what the taxation would be there, what the taxation would be here, do the numbers and figure out if it's worth using this device. Because the limited liability company is available, it can, it can eliminate your Massachusetts estate tax. The question is, is it worth it for you? What's the cost of doing it? So, what are your possibilities in terms of dealing with the estate tax? Well, one possibility, of course, is you could just gift the property to your children, right? If you gift the property to your children, um, and, and in Frank and Mary's case, now I'm going back to my assumption that their total estate value is $1.2 million. Um, if, you get, if they gift the property to their children and therefore drop their estate value below a million dollars, then there is no Massachusetts inheritance tax. Because remember, that's the rule in Massachusetts. If you, ha if, oh, excuse me, 
If you had an estate of $1.2 million, you would have a tax of about $64,000. If you have an estate in Massachusetts that's worth less than a million dollars, there is no inheritance tax. So the goal of the exercise is to get your estate below a million dollars. So if you can do that by simply gifting away the cottage, that's one way of doing it. Now, what's the problem with that? We talked about this, right? The problem is you gift the property to your kids, you die and they turn around and sell it. They're paying a big, big capital gains tax, right? That's the trade. Now, you may think that's a great idea because maybe you don't want them to sell it. You want there to almost be disincentives to them selling it because you're hoping that in the great scheme of things, they figure out a way to try to keep the cottage for your kids and your grandchildren, et cetera, right? But you should simply be aware of the fact that that's, that's the trade-off. So on the one hand, you're, you're giving your children a high capital gains liability if they sell. On the other hand, you're eliminating your estate tax. You're eliminating your Massachusetts estate tax in this case, right? Um, by simply transferring the property early. If you transfer it to them and keep a life estate in the property, or if you transfer it to an irrevocable trust and keep a life estate in the property, remember for, for capital gains tax purposes, right, uh, it, it, that property is still yours and therefore the basis jumps to the date of death value. That's good. For estate tax purposes, also, that property is still yours which means when you die, it gets included in your estate. So if you deed the property to your kids and keep a life estate, or if you deed to an irrevocable trust and keep a life estate, you're gonna pay a Massachusetts inheritance tax, unless the total estate is worth less than a million dollars. Probate avoidance, a, a very, very common goal. Uh, I just gave you some, give you some estimates here uh, of the cost, the legal cost of going through probate. This came from attorneys that I've spoken to because we have kind of corresponding relationships with attorneys in all of these states. Uh, so in Massachusetts, a probate of this size with these kinds of properties would probably cost five to $10,000 and would take about 13 months to get through, right? To the extent that you want to avoid that cost and um, avoid the delays, and a lot of times it's really the delays that you want to deal with, right? It's really handy uh, to look at mechanisms to avoid having to go through the probate process. Now, the way that Frank and Mary could do that, um, there is at least one of their assets is not going to go through probate, and that's Frank's IRA. Well, also Mary's IRA, because IRAs have death beneficiaries attached to them. So Frank's would simply say, when I die, this money instantly goes to Mary. Or, when I die, if Mary has died, it instantly goes to my kids. So those mechanisms are going to be built in. The things they need to deal with are those bank accounts that they have worth $100,000, their home, and of course the cottage. Um, there are several ways that they can avoid having those properties go through probate. One of them, of course, is just to gift the property to the kids. We already talked about that. A second possibility uh, would be to have Frank and Mary create a revocable and amendable trust keep complete control over this cottage by creating a trust, naming themselves as the trustees for the benefit of their, themselves and the kids, saying that they can revoke at any time, amend at any time, do whatever they want, right? But then say that when the two of them have died, when Frank and Mary have both died, the, the kids, or one of the kids at least, immediately steps into the shoes of those trustees, takes over the property, can then sell it right away or can do whatever they want with it, or they can do whatever the trust says. So for folks who are not really worried about nursing home issues and are not especially worried about estate tax avoidance, right, this isn't a bad choice because they can eliminate their probate costs by simply doing this up front. And in all of the states that I mentioned, they can do this with one trust. You can have one trust into which you would convey both the cottage and your home, whether it's in Massachusetts or in any of these other states, so that you can kind of minimize your legal costs. So this is kind of a handy mechanism. This also works with an irrevocable trust. So if they are trying to save the, the cottage for nursing home purposes, they were thinking of either transferring it to their kids or transferring it to the, an irrevocable trust for the benefit of their kids. By transferring it to an irrevocable trust, they are able like by, in the same way as they would, would by transferring it to their kids, to eliminate having this property have to go through probate. So they can use any of these mechanisms in order to deal with 
avoiding the probate process. Finally, <clears throat> there's leaving it to the kids. Um, my strong recommendation to you, based on now having spent three years here in this wonderful place, and by the way, it just, well, I don't have to tell you, this is just an amazing place. That's why we're renting here, for the, we're down on Siloam, looking, overlooking the lake every day, every night. And we were at Illumination Night last night, you know, and it's just a magic place. The, the, the best thing that you can do for your kids if you want to keep the property in the family is not to leave it to them, right? Not to leave it to them directly. Not to say, in your will, here, it just goes to the kids. The reason for that, for that is, by doing that, you are, you are leaving them with all of the rules that they need to figure out regarding how to manage this property with no mechanism for how to figure out what happens if they disagree with the rules, right? Because if you're leaving the three of them, Mary, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr., the cottage, effectively, you are, you are giving each of them a veto over every decision that has to be made regarding the upkeep, the maintenance, who pays for what, what hap who's, who can visit, what nieces and nephews can come, are we going to be able to rent the pro all that stuff. Nothing has been figured out, and you're hoping they're going to figure it out. Now, I am told, I remember Craig Lowe telling me that there are something like 30 cottages here that have been in the family kind of since the beginning, right? So obviously somebody has figured it out. And it may be that your kids will be able to figure that out. I'm just suggesting to you that for every one of those, I mean, there were 30 of them that have stayed in the family the whole time. There are 300 others that didn't. And sometimes that was because everything was fine, but sometimes it was because it wasn't so fine. And I've talked to several people who are in the campground right now where things aren't so fine, trying to figure out a number of competing interests, that issue of what happens when you have one of the children who really can't afford to pay their fair, their, 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 well, well, call their fair share, and one who can. What about if, you know, somebody thinks you really need to fix the roof because it's starting to leak, but you know, the others don't. Or what about when the grandchildren start, to, how do you figure all that out? So I guess, you know, there, there are, if you just leave it to the kids, that is increasing the likelihood significantly that things aren't going to work out. 